Hi friends, welcome to Bookish Bliss, our virtual book club. Every week we will dig into a section of chapters in our favorite books. Let's get started. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to episode 34 of Bookish Bliss. We have a lot to discuss today. Yes, this week we are covering chapters 9 through 17 of Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. There will be no spoilers beyond the covered chapters. You don't have to read the whole book to listen. You just have to be caught up on the chapters we're covering. Amanda Darling, what are you drinking tonight? Tonight I have LaCroix, but not orange. I'm into this pamel mousse now. I don't know if that's how you say it. Oh, you've <laughs> upgraded. But yeah, it's really, really good. And there may or may not have some tequila in here by the end of the night. So we'll see. Ooh. I brought the bottle. <laughs> might, might pour a little bit in, but we'll see. Yeah, depending on what we're talking about, you might need yeah. to add a little bit in. <laughs> yeah. What are you drinking tonight? I am drinking because I am feeling sad that summer is over. So I'm holding on to it a little bit yes. with a White Claw watermelon. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I'm definitely going to have tequila in mine because you ain't drinking alone, bitch. I know. I was like, <laughs> should I surprise her and actually have an alcoholic beverage tonight? So No, I'm so surprised and so happy. Here I, I literally am. took the tequila, but I'm like, oh, if she doesn't drink, I won't drink. So funny. Looks right, like we're drinking. Let me crack this open. <laughs> me too. Woo! Woo! as I spill it everywhere every single time. <laughs> well, cheers to episode 34. And we do have a lot to discuss today. So yes, cheers. cheers. We're gonna need it. Mm -hmm. Now let's get started with the good stuff and break down fourth wing part two. Take it away, Megan. All right. So we have a lot of chapters to discuss today because apparently in 100 pages, there was a ton of chapters and so much Crazy. happened. So I just don't so even much. understand how this was 100 pages. We always Neither. cover 100 pages. And this is nuts. I think too, fourth wing, like we were saying when we read Iron Flame, the pages have like double the fucking words yeah. than normal books. Yeah. So yeah, we gotta rethink. <laughs> re we got strategy for we that, gotta re for yeah. Iron Flame. Iron Flame maybe eighty pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. All right. Our voices are gonna be tired tonight. All right. Here we go. Yeah. Chapter nine. Zayden completely wipes the floor with Violet, aka violence, but it also happened to be a secret lesson in sparring for her. So picking right back up where we left off last episode. All his whispers and touches, it was steamy. It made me <laughs> crave more for these enemies, or are they? Their mm. slow burn is just so good, but so painful. Later that night, Dane is giving Violet a massage in his bedroom, where instead of taking the opportunity to seduce her like we all know he wants to, he literally tries to convince her again to go to the scribe quadrant. Give it up already. Give it the fuck up already, Dane. You're so annoying. So annoying. So the epigraph for this chapter is short, sweet, and to the point. <laughs> I will not die today. This is from Violet Sorengale's personal addendum to the Book of Brennan. <laughs> so perfect. Her new she, mantra. <laughs> she says it every day. Literally every day. Multiple times a day. <laughs> you have to in a place like Biscayeth. True, true. I mean, you could literally die at any moment. Yes. So Violet is about to face Zayden on the mat to spar against him today, which is overall not good for Violet. Since he can kick her ass, she knows that he wants to kill her as well. So it's not looking good for our girl. No. I was like, <laughs> in the first read of this, I'm like, oh God. I'm pretty sure we both did it on the second read of this as true, well. Yeah, we're like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zayden, though, on the other hand, seems to be enjoying himself as he prepares to face Violet in the challenge. We get to see him call her Violence for the first time, and he is just much faster than Violet and stronger. But as the challenge is progressing, he's not hurting her. He's teaching her. He's teaching her all different tactics and strategies on how to beat him or other opponents she may face in real life, or challenges showing her where fatal stab strikes could be on their enemies. Which is just obviously really surprising because to the viewer on the outside of the mat, it just looks like he is wiping the floor with her. Yeah. But yeah. secretly, he is teaching her all these different 
tips and tricks. So you kind of get to see for the first time, well, not, I guess the first time, but like another time since they were out under her tree, another side of Zayden and Violet interactions. And the whole time that you were just reading that, I was thinking, Dane is such a horrible actor and everyone figured out that they were like super close in one day and he can literally make everyone else think that he's beating the shit out of her. Yeah. (laughs) But really be training her, Zayden. Yeah, and she's not her at all. I just really hate Dane. (laughs) I can't tell. (laughs) Why? (laughs) Well, he's fucking annoying, Megan. Leave her alone. She's staying in the writer's quadrant. That's true. He is annoying. Even though Zayden continues to take dagger after dagger away from Violet during their challenge, disarming her at an alarmingly fast rate, she is very drawn to Zayden. She keeps having to remind herself that she is not attracted to toxic men. (laughs) Lies. We, I guess we all have to do that every once in a while. We all have to remind ourselves that we are not attracted to a toxic man. But I, I think I think we she are. He's toxic, but I don't think he's toxic. I think he's just morally gray, which is a little toxic, I guess. But it's an acceptable toxic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll agree. <laughs> But as he continues to touch her throughout this lesson, her body is not listening to her head. She wants him bad. Violet is shocked, though, that he is showing her all these fatal maneuvers, though she never takes that route to win. So he always knows by watching her other challenges that she never goes for the fatal blow. She just does whatever she can to get the win in the challenge. So he knows this. He notices everything. And he's like, I think you need to start practicing these fatal moves you need to start taking these hits he's like honey you're in the rider's quadrant you might not want to kill somebody but you're gonna have to eventually (laughs) exactly dane is having a conniption and once zayden has had violet pinned down for longer than necessary they were having a moment dane he says that (laughs) violet has had enough Zayden is annoyed at how overprotective Dane is acting towards Violet, but reminds Violet that her secret about poisoning her opponents is safe with him. So again, he Mm -hmm. notices everything. He knows exactly what violence has been up to and knows she's not taking these fatal blows against her opponents and that she's been poisoning them. Yeah. As the challenge is coming to an end, he puts her final dagger back into her vest, which shocks Violet, but Zayden says defenseless women have never been his thing. And Zayden tells Dane that Violet could use a little less protection and a little more instruction, which I a thousand percent agree with. I agree too. It's not even protections. It's like an obsessive need to get her out. Like that's not even protection at this point. Like you're not helping her. Yeah, it's his only focus at this point. I, yeah. I wonder if other aspects of his life are also declining or failing in some way because his sole focus and purpose is to get Violet out of the rider's quadrant. Yeah, but he fails miserably at it so, and being her friend. So fuck him. <laughs> he is just not doing an overall good job. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Dane is still shook later on in the evening when he is giving Violet a massage in his room that Zayden let her live. Dane had once thought that Zayden could still be plotting against Navarre even though he bonded Sigale until he learned how protective the dragons are of the veil. Yes, and in this conversation with Dane and Violet, we learn that Cap is actually in Dane's head and they are connected through their minds. So Cap would know if Dane was lying to him and all writers have this connection Mm -hmm. with their dragons and it's impossible to hide anything from them so they are literally in your mind at all times you will no longer have any thoughts to yourself (laughs) no you will never be alone again never dane tells violet that he spoke to colonel markham of the threats against Violet's life. The colonel has agreed to allow Violet to transfer to the scribe quadrant, that he would put her with the first years and she wouldn't have to wait until conscription day. Dane is extra freaked out since Rhiannon told him that someone left crushed Violet's on her bed. So that's all he needed to hear. It's just another reason to add to his list of a million reasons about why she shouldn't be here anymore. I don't understand either why they don't think the mom's going to find out. Of course she's going to find out. Of course she's going to find out. I don't understand 
what universe would she not find out? Somebody is going to tell her. Yeah. It's a big school, but it's not that big of a school that she's not going to find out her daughters in the archives. Yeah. Stupid. So stupid. Violet is pissed off that Dane went behind her back and continues to have doubt in her and saying that she isn't going to cut it. That he says it every day before formation, after formation, before class, after class, at dinner, after dinner. Like, it just doesn't stop. I told you, Megan, he's so annoying. (laughs) (laughs) He is annoying. Violet also reminds Dane that Zayden is her wing leader and he has every right to challenge her and do whatever he wants. And that includes executing her. Dane throws it in Violet's face that Zayden wiped the floor with her today and took all of her daggers, making it look easy to defeat her in front of everyone. So she already has a target on her back for being weak and a liability to her wing. So Dane's like, great. Now this is just another reason to give these people who already want to kill you another chance to go after and kill you because of what they saw today, which is true. (laughs) It is true. But I also think if he didn't step in, she would have got her ass beat for real. Oh, for sure. So I feel like that was the true reason why obviously he did it. Like he would rather make her look stupid than her actually fucking die. Yeah, no, definitely. (laughs) Yeah, no, that has to be the reason because there's no other reason why he went into that ring that that day and didn't kill her. Yeah, he's clearly not going to kill her. He had plenty of opportunities, so I'm not sure why, but he's not going to kill her. (laughs) Yeah, just like literally the end of last episode just cracks me up when I still think about it. When he's like, hurry up before your wing leader catches you out after curfew. And she's like, you are my wing leader. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, what the fuck is going on? Yes. That's just. Oh, yeah, that was so funny. One of the lines that just always sticks with me from this book. Just (laughs) their banter just cracks me up. But that's like one of my favorite ones. Violet tells Dane that she has made it two months in the Riders Quadrant. And that is more than she can say than half the people in her class, basically. Tell him, Violet. Tell him. Tell that motherfucker. But Dean reminds her that she has no idea what she is getting into when it comes to threshing. Yes, and more facts about threshing here. Every first year gets thrown into the training grounds, which they've never been into before. But it's not only about bonding with a dragon. The first years are also taking out their vendettas and liabilities to their wings. And the second and third years have to watch. Yes. Oof. Which is Dane's whole argument. Dane is like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to stand by. And if something happens to you, I just have to stand there and let it happen. I can't step in and help you at all. And he cannot lose her. We know. We We know, Dane. (laughs) You'd rather her be the shell of a person than actually do something that could kill her. Yeah, exactly. Dane says Markham will not tell her mother. He just wants her to think about it. And Violet agrees to think about it. Because one, I think she's just over the argument. And two, Dane makes some really good points about being in threshing. And I think it does scare her a little bit. I think when she has these conversations with him, she really does start to doubt herself. Does she really belong here? Yeah, because he's ruining her fucking confidence. He's so annoying. Yes, we need more Dane and more Zayden. Yeah, for sure. Moving on to chapter 10, it's time for a deadly challenge. The cadets and Violet squad are given an hour to start practicing the gauntlet. It has five ascents that will try to kill you, but will also prepare you to be able to ride a dragon. It is necessary for our gang to complete the gauntlet before being able to go to presentation in front of the dragons. And Violet is struggling with completing the last ascents due to her height, and she is real worried she's not going to be able to complete the challenge if she doesn't she'll be dead we get to see a zayden and violent moment at the end of the chapter and he gives her some great advice the right way is not the only way to do it that's right zayden <laughs> see it's good advice for a good friend dane <laughs> and they're not even friends right they're not even friends our graph for this chapter is don't underestimate the challenge of the gauntlet mira It's designed to test your balance, strength, and agility. The times don't matter for shit, only that you make it to the top. Reach for the ropes when you have to. Coming in last is better than coming in dead. Page 46 of the Book of Brennan. Book of Brennan. There's lots of good info. I wish we could like actually have a copy of it. So we could, Me too. We could just go to the section and see it and read all the notes and all this stuff. That would be fun. Yeah. 
So, Rhiannon and Violet are looking up at the beast, which is the gauntlet. Orly, on the other hand, their squad mate, thinks that the course looks amazing. We learned that her dad is a retired rider, and he used to set up practice courses for her and her brother, Chase, all the time. Her brother, Chase, also told her it's the best part about being in the rider's quadrant until thrashing. Apparently, he is currently with the Southern Wing, but he's basically on desk duty as they barely see any action near the Crevolian border. He says that they need to watch out for the giant post jutting off the cliff they could get crushed by them (laughs) (laughs) violet really considers the scribe quadrant at this moment but then there's the little voice in the back of her head that says but you've already made it this far yes which is so true listen to that voice violet yes instead of dane please please (laughs) Riddick doesn't know why they called the gauntlet the gauntlet. And Tynan, who is a jerk, says to keep the dragons coming back to threshing and weeding out the weak. Riddick and Tynan get into an argument and Riddick Riddick accuses him of being so far up Jack Barlow's ass he thinks he can be rude to his squad mates. But Tynan is more worried about their timing since they are scored as a squad and he doesn't want them being presented last at presentation in front of the dragons. But... Sawyer tells them that time doesn't mean anything and the last cadet bonded last year. Listen to somebody that actually has experience. Stupid. (laughs) Yeah. Stupid. So more about this gauntlet. It's described as a menacing obstacle course that's carved into the front of a ridgeline so steep it may as well be a cliff. The zigzagging death trap trail rises up, climbing in five distinct switchbacks of 180 degree turns, each increasing in difficulty on the way up to the top of the bluff that separates the citadel from the flight field and the veil. Sounds so fun. So fun. fun. It sounds fucking terrifying. (laughs) Yeah. I would be not letting go of any rope ever. I would just be hanging there for the rest of my life. Yeah, I'd be like, (laughs) you can't kill me if I don't let go. Yeah. (laughs) Then all of a sudden you see a dragon flames coming your way. Yeah. Professor Emeretto shows up and tells them that the gauntlet is called the gauntlet because this is the cliff that guards the veil. We have 10 one hour practices until they will be ranked for presentation, which will determine if the dragons find them worthy at threshing in two and a half weeks. There are ropes every six feet for practice, but if you touch it, there's a 30 second penalty, but it's better than death, as Brennan has told us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they can't climb down it's either you complete the gauntlet or you fall to your death yes not during practice during practice you can climb down yes. but during the actual gauntlet you have to figure it out or die exactly and that's just how the riders quadrant is yeah. everything is like you do it or you die no chance for infantry if you fail <laughs> I still think before you walk across the parapet, you're not actually a rider or a cadet yet. True. So if true, you fall, true. there should be some sort of net and then you have to automatically go into the infantry. But that's just me. No, you're right. If you're not even a cadet, once you're a cadet, I can understand the punishments, mm-hmm. but not beforehand. True, true, true. Hey, 67 bodies they could have used. <laughs> right? To fight off those fucking griffins. Yeah. What the heck? Yeah. Professor Amaretto says that they are the only squad still intact and that their squad leader must be so proud of them. Tynan acts up again and says that Atos is super proud of Violet (laughs) and he thinks that they are sleeping together. And even Luca, that little bitchy girl, has feelings about it. And if it means that Violet is getting preferential treatment, she doesn't like it. Rihanna steps in for her bestie and shuts them all up by telling them that Violet and Dane have been best friends since Dane's dad is Violet's mom's aide. And don't they know anything about their leadership? Which basically shuts them up, but Tynan has to add that Jack told everyone that they were sleeping together. And Riddick says that listening to that asshole is going to get him killed. Foreshadowing! (laughs) Foreshadowing! He said that Dane would have them on cleanup duty if he was here, but Violet says in her head that Zayden would have kicked their asses. It's true. Ooh, so true. <laughs> Fionn says that they should have been allowed to practice this from after the parapet, but they are told that this is all part of the challenge. Oh, yes. And you know what else is part of the challenge? There's fucking stairs right there that they're allowed to use later. 
<laughs> but they aren't allowed to use them to get to the flight field until after threshing. So imagine it's that. Just, <laughs> just like a nice little slap in the face of all the things they can't do to live. <laughs> they can see the stairs the whole time too. That would be like for me. Oh, for sure. Like I'm going to die. But that's terrible. Funny. <laughs> that is terrible. <laughs> yes. So every one of the five ascents on this course is designed to mimic the challenges that they will face in battle. From the balance you must keep on the back of a dragon to the strength you'll need to hold your seat during maneuvers to know you'll need to fight on the ground and then to still be able to mount your dragon at a second's notice. There is no alternative route. If you don't make it up there, there's no going to presentation. Therefore, you do not bond. You die. <laughs> You're dead. You're dead. The first ascent is that they have to run the length of a 15-foot spinning log and jump across four granite pillars spaced three feet apart, hop into a giant spinning wheel, and time the exit to hop out onto the other end of the path. I'm already dead. That Right? <laughs> so easy i'm sorry what was i thinking so easy yeah second is said hug the five buoy balls and swing slash spin to launch between them this sounds like american ninja warrior now i was just gonna (laughs) say that i was gonna say do you think rebecca yaros was watching american ninja warrior when she wrote the gauntlet yes or she's a fan and she thought about it yeah (laughs) it's definitely the inspo here Oh, for sure. Then is swing hand over hand across three iron rails. The rails are lined up and and each rod hangs a half of a foot higher than the last. Then they have to jump across a series of shaking iron pillars. Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) I say that this one probably seems the least intimidating so far of the three, but no, it's definitely buoy balls for me. You think the buoy balls are the less intimidating? Yeah. I don't think I could hold, like, hold up. Like, I couldn't hug and then, like, get to the next one. Yeah. I think I would really struggle with that. Well, I feel like I would, I just don't have that good of balance to be able to do any other ones. I think my balance would be better than my, like, arm strength. Yeah, no, I feel like I could handle the arm strength and the legs. Like, my legs, I could wrap around a tree all day. (laughs) That's that Pilates for you. Yeah, that Pilates, that bar workout. (laughs) The scent is they have to sprint up a staircase of seven rolling logs. Each log rolls in the opposite direction of the last. Yeah. And at least the fifth ascent, they have to hop up the conduit of the 20 degree leaning chimney by forming an X to span its width. And the base of the chimney is an open fall down the cliffside. That's <laughs> this where, is where I would Megan go. would go. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to finish, it's not even over yet. You have to sprint up the wooden face of the 10-foot vertical ramp, leap to grasp the ledge of the cliff, and climb up to complete the course. That part is definitely another sign that it's American Ninja Warrior because I do that at the end of every course. They literally do. Yeah, you're right. And touch the button. Yeah. Boom! (laughs) I wish they had that at the top of this, but I don't think they have technology, so. Yeah, probably not. (laughs) But, you know. And, of course... As I would do, Violet asks the god of luck to be with her before she goes, even on her practice run, because she's like, Lord, help me. Lord, please save me. Yeah. Violet, as she is going through the gauntlet, is reciting her facts to keep her mind calm as she goes to the course, of course. Of course she is. So this week, it's about dragons. Ooh. Feathertail dragons are the breed we know the least about. This is because they abhor violence and are not suitable for bonding. But she can't be certain since one has never left the veil within her lifetime. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. (laughs) Green dragons, known for their keen intellect, descend from the honorable, I'm going to botch this, Ewain Lloydsig line. Oh my God. That was such a great attempt. I loved it. (laughs) You're so supportive, Megan. You're welcome. Everyone needs a Megan in their life. (laughs) I'll give you shit, but I'll always have your back. That's true. That's very true. Not to be the most rational of the dragon kind, making them the perfect siege weapon, especially in the case of club tails. Hmm. Orange dragons come in various shades of apricot to carrot, and they are the most unpredictable of dragon kind, and therefore always a risk. So as Violet is going through the course, she almost slips when she's doing the third ascent, but she's able to grab onto one of the ropes. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the God of luck. (laughs) Literally. 
She said she's made it seven weeks and this course was not going to get her today. Violet thinks Orly is nuts because she is having a blast completing this course behind her. Orly gives Violet some good advice for the fourth ascent and Violet makes it across and is so excited. She's like, Woo, I did it. <laughs> Violet makes room for Orly, but as she is starting, but as Orly is starting to go across, a dragon flies overhead. Yeah, these dragons, they get real close to the gauntlet as they fly over to the veil because it's right there. Yeah so crazy i'd also get distracted by that because yeah. they haven't really seen any dragons since the first day and it's probably like a big whoosh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> i'm dead i'm fucking dead <laughs> We have to be serious because I'm someone's going to die. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Violet then watches in horror as Orly cries out and slips off the fifth post and her stomach hits the log and she spins off and she falls down the cliff to her death. R.I.P. Orly. I guess those backyard practice rings were rinkety dink ones because oh. she's the one that practiced. I know. And she was so excited. She's like, I got this. This is so great. Keeping up that squad energy. Yeah. And then she gets distracted by a fucking dragon. <laughs> and then she's falling to her death. Like, that's just so horrible. This book is that's so awful. mean. I know. <laughs> Literally, I was thinking the same thing. Like, brutal. It's it's brutal. But I mean, of course, Beskayeth, that's brutal. We're in war for 600 years. Like, nothing is going to be easy. No, I know. <laughs> You can't even practice, apparently, because you'll still die. You'll still die during practice. Literally. Violet is not doing well the next morning. Obviously, she's not doing well. They're in formation while they're reading out the death roll, especially when Orly's name is called. Violet is going to take care of Orly's belongings. Yes, so every best guy of parent has two options when their cadet is killed. They can retrieve the body and the belongings for burial or burning, or the school will put their body under a stone and burn their belongings themselves. And this burn pit is literally just up on the stone roof, and it's nothing more than an extra wide barrel whose only purpose is to incinerate yeah. people's belongings that have passed. Yes, because as we know, they have to give all their stuff as a tribute to Mallet. Dane wants to know if Violet made it through the course after formation is over, but she says that she didn't. She got stuck at the fifth ascent. She is too small to span the distance, but she will figure something out before the day comes. Violet drops Orly's pack into the fire as a tribute to Malik, the god of death. As she is walking back, she can see the gauntlet, and she says that its next victim will not be her, even though she is super worried about surviving the course. She also sees Zayden, Bodhi, and Garrick walking back in and wonders where they are coming from, and she mm. hides. We hear Garrick say, we are doing everything we can, before Zayden halts and says he will follow them in. And her scalp prickles and she oh. knows that Zayden knows that she is there <sighs> Zayden is surprised that Violet really doesn't care though where he and his friends have been Zayden thinks it's amusing that Violet is frustrated wanting to know when he is going to kill her but Zayden informs her that he hasn't decided yet <laughs> which is just so funny because it's so obvious to us as the reader like you said earlier that he is not going to kill her but no. she still thinks that he's going to kill her even though he would just do it right now if he was going to yeah kill. literally Violet wants Zayden to hurry it up and figure it out and what her chances were which Zayden says that is the oddest way he has ever been hit on <laughs> <laughs> the banta. Zayden listens intently at her mental breakdown and not being able to get up the gauntlet. Zayden also tells her that leaving her alive causes the majority of his problems. Zayden knows that losing a squad mate, not being able to get up the chimney, and her offer to join the scribe quadrant is throwing her off. Yes, and we fucking learn about Zayden's powers in this chapter. He tells Violet that he knows everything that goes on here at Biscayeth with the help of his shadows. They know everything, see everything, and conceal everything. Ooh, mysterious. We'll keep your secrets. <laughs> 
<laughs> Zayden tells Violet to focus on the things that can kill her so she can find a way not to die. There are so many people in the quadrant that want her dead, yet she is still alive. Zayden tells her to stop sulking in her own self-pity and that she would see if she has everything she needs to survive the gauntlet, which is just like the exact opposite of advice that Dane would be giving her in this moment. Literally exact opposite. And they've been friends since they were yeah. five years old, which is over a decade. She's over than yeah. 15. Zayden tells her what will make her a rider is how she deals with herself after people die. Zayden is explaining basically that Violet is still alive because she is the scale he currently judges himself against and that every day he lets her live, he feels like he is still a decent person or there's still a decent person inside of him. So if she Aww. wants to quit, then it'll just be easier for him. And he leaves her with that quote I said earlier, the right way isn't the only way and to figure it out. I love that. Right? He, I think, knows that he got the shit end of his stick because of his parents. So why would he do the same thing to Violet when he doesn't think it's fair that he's getting it done to him and all his friends, literally? Yeah. He's very in tune with that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Chapter 11. Today is the day. We are still extremely worried for Violet as she has never completed the gauntlet in any of her practice runs. Dane is also freaking out and trying to get her to run away to the scribe quadrant again. Of course. She tell <laughs> what else is fucking new? She tells Dane to close his eyes if he can't put his big boy pants on. Our girl is a smarty because she thinks of a genius way to get up the final two obstacles that she is struggling with. A stupid brown noser with a hidden agenda, aka the wing leader from third wing argues that violet cheated violet makes her case which we will go into later and zayden signs with her swoon but zayden would like her to clean up her bloody hands thanks <laughs> he's like don't touch me with your bloody hands <laughs> literally fuck that wing leader too fuck her anyways so the epigraph for this chapter is it is a grave offense against malik to keep the belongings of a dead loved one they belong in the beyond with the god of death and the departed. In the absence of a proper temple, any fire will do. He who does not burn for Malak will be burned by Malak. And this is from Major Rorley's Guide to Appeasing the Gods, the second edition. Hmm. So Malak will burn you if you don't burn everybody's shit? <sighs> That's what that's what it says. That sounds like it'll scare you into doing something you don't want to do. <laughs> exactly. So like keep control over people. Yeah. Violet wants to set the whole course on fire because the night before presentation, she has still not made it up the chimney. Rhiannon wants to help her, but Sawyer reminds them that another cadet cannot help another cadet on the route or touch them. Violet knows if she is going to run away to the scribe quadrant, it will have to be tonight, but she cannot guarantee her mother wouldn't find out. And if she hides, she will never know if she was good enough. That's right, Violet. You will never know. <laughs> so here we are at presentation day, like you mentioned earlier in your summary. Everything about the writer's quadrant is designed to weed out the weak, as we know. And this day is no exception. The cadets will have to climb the gauntlet, though, in order to get to the flight field first. Mm -hmm. Since Violet learned that Dane's patch meant he had a top secret signet, she's been super aware of all the patches around her. Yep. She's paying attention, our girl. She sees it as intelligence that she may one day need to defeat them. Violet sees a circular patch with water and floating spears and wonders what it means. Mm, maybe a water bender. Ooh. <laughs> she knows the triangular patch with the long swords means they are not to be messed with on the mat. Must yeah, be she's a warrior patch or something. Definitely paying attention to that patch. For sure. She's like, I do not want to go against them. <laughs> no. I'm just keeping a cow as we go through our little events here in the Riders Quadrant for the first year. And there is 171 of them that will participate in the gauntlet and maybe presentation day if they get through the gauntlet. <laughs> maybe. We'll see. Maybe. So the squad is super nervous after formation to head into the gauntlet, and Violet is such a good squad mate. She calms Trina and checks in with Rhiannon, who only says she's not worried, and she's not worried for Violet either, where Violet makes a joke about their test tomorrow. She's like, I didn't mean the gauntlet. I meant, do you think we're going to pass the test? Yeah, <laughs> and of course we get what the test is going to be about from Violet. The Treaty of Arif, an <laughs> agreement between Navarre and Krovla for mutually shared airspace for both dragons and griffins 
Mountains over a narrow strip of the Espen Mountains between Somerton and Drathius. Thanks, Violet. You're welcome. I love being Violet. Where's my shadow daddy? <laughs> What do we think is going to happen next, Amanda? Fucking Dane is going to say, go to the scribe quadrant, Violet. Oh my God, Amanda, you're exactly right. Dane <laughs> begs Violet not to go through the gauntlet today, and he doesn't think he can watch, so Violet tells him to close his eyes. Dane wants to know what changed between parapet and now, and she tells him, me. That's right, Violet. Also, I was just thinking we should have done a drinking game every time Dane tries to convince Violet not to do the writer's project because we'd be fucked up by the end of this episode. We would need our stomachs pumped and it's a Tuesday. We would both be taking tomorrow off even though I can't but. I can't either. (sighs) Fucking jobs. (laughs) (laughs) An hour after they arrive at the course Violet is starting. Rhiannon is already at the top cheering her on and to get up to the chimney so she makes it all the way to the last ascent that she has been struggle bussing with. So to get up the chimney she takes a rope taking that 30 second penalty and wraps it around her waist and uses the side of the chimney to climb up, which is just so genius. So genius. People are questioning, is she allowed to do that? But she did it and she just has one more challenge to go, getting up that wooden ramp. She remembers Zayden's words and she hopes that she can pull this thing off. She decides to get a running start because we all know she has the speed. That's the one thing she has going for her and daggers. And she starts running and waits until she feels that shift in gravity and she's two feet away from the top. And she literally swings out her arm and digs a dagger into the ramp and basically throws herself over the edge to the cliff to the top. People are questioning, again, can she do this? But her squad is just happy that she made it up. Yeah. But our little brown noser with a hidden agenda, Amber Mavis, the wing leader of Third Wing. She even has a brown noser name. Yeah. (laughs) Amber Mavis. Yeah. She is super pissed off and calls Violet a cheater as she storms her way over to Zayden. Amber says that she used illegal material twice and that it cannot be tolerated. They live by the rules or they die by them. Garrick is not impressed and says that he doesn't take kindly to calling people in his section a cheater. So it's just already interesting that Garrick is already kind of stepping in for Violet, which I yeah. thought was interesting there because he could have just let Zayden handle it. But yeah. he's like, no, I don't take kindly to this either. But he does tell Amber that their wing leader will handle any rule breaking in his own wing. Zayden calls Violet over and tells Violet to explain herself. And Violet basically says she knows that she will get the 30 second penalty for using the rope. But then she starts quoting the codex from when Amber questions her about the dagger. Zayden completely ignores Amber while he's waiting for Violet to make her case. Yeah, so Violet of course mentions that a rider may only bring to the quadrant the items they can carry, and they shall not be separated from those items no matter what they may be. For once carried over the parapet, they are considered part of the person, which is Article 3, Section 6, Addendum B. Amber doesn't like this. She tries to explain to Violet that this was meant for thievery to be an offense, but Violet says that it made it a part of the rider. Violet says it wasn't a challenge blade, it was one she carried in with her, and that the right way isn't always the only way. Okay, Zayden Jr. (laughs) (laughs) Zayden holds Violet's gaze when he tells Amber that Violet had her, and Amber tries to insult Violet by saying she thinks like a scribe, but Violet takes it as a compliment, which I would too. Me too. Like, you're literally calling her smart. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. (laughs) Zayden then tells Violet to take care of her bleeding hands. And Rian and, of course, our girl Bestie is there to help Violet wrap her hands. And their whole squad made it up the course. So they are still all intact at this point. Woo! Woo! Chapter 12. We made it! It is time for our squad to be presented in front of the dragons who are willing to bond this year. There is a surprise dragon at the end of the line, which is a golden feather tail. The cadets are told to speak to each other while walking in front of the dragons to show who they are and how 
well they play with others. We have a mixed bag in our squad. Some can and some really cannot. (laughs) Violet, to distract everyone, tells them about Wyvern, who are mythical creatures from their childhood nightmares, to keep everyone's nerves at bay. Violet also has a close encounter with two green dragons who smell her best, but as always, our girl is able to talk herself out of a sticky situation, but another task in becoming a rider is complete. She has survived again. See, Violet, you wouldn't have known that you could survive if you went to the Scribe Quadrant. Exactly. So the epigraph for this chapter is, Presentation Day is unlike any other. The air is ripe with possibilities, and possibly the stench of sulfur from a dragon who has been offended. Never look a red in the eye. Never back down from a green. If you show trepidation to a brown, well, just don't. And this is from Colonel Kaori's Field Guide to Dragonkind. It's presentation day, people. It's presentation day. (laughs) So after the gauntlet, 169 of them make it to presentation. And Violet's squad placed 11th out of the 36 squads. So they did pretty good. Not bad. Not Not bad. bad. Not bad. We learned that Liam Mari was the fastest up the gauntlet and won him the gauntlet patch, which is not surprising at all. Nope. And we learned that Violet also wasn't the slowest, even with her 30 second penalty. And that was good enough for her. That's right. You're not at the bottom. So you're good. Yeah. The dragons at presentation day average about 25 feet tall, and they are all in a formation of their own lined up and close enough to pass judgment on them as they walk by. Ooh, another scary task. Another scary task. Garrick lines up the squad while Violet is wondering if Dane is thrilled she made it up or is disappointed that she bent the rules. Probably disappointed that you I was thinking the same fucking thing. He'd rather her be dead than be a rule breaker. Yeah. Violet describes Garrick's tone as all business, which doesn't surprise her since his leadership style is mission first, niceties last. Violet thinks it's no wonder he is so close to Zayden. Garrick does wear his patches, though, unlike Zayden, which says that he is the flame section leader and more than five patches showing his skill with many weapons. Ooh. I need to know more about this Garrick. Me too. He seems cool, though. Yeah. He reminds me of Cassian a little bit. Yeah. Also, the whole time you were saying that, all I could think was Dane is such a rule follower, but also wants to break the rules and send her to the scratch. (laughs) Right? Make it fucking make sense, Dane. He's a fucking hypocrite. He's only interested in his own agenda, what he wants, not what anybody else wants or what's best for anybody else. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so presentation day is a straight walk down the meadow. They walk up, wait for the entire squad to get there, and then they walk back down. And it is recommended that cadets stay seven feet apart in case, you know, sulfur. <laughs> it's we a learned, quick <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's very hot and quick. We learn for the first time that there is a feather tail willing to bond. So they are there are officially 101 dragons that are willing to bond this year. But Garrick tells them to relax. It's probably just curious, and he can't even rem- remember the last time one was seen outside of the veil. And feather tails, they don't even bond. No. So he's telling them not to be worried about it. Yeah. Garrick passes them off to the Quadrant senior wing leader, who is a woman she's only seen a few times in battle brief speaking to Zayden. She just puts them in a single file, which I just think is so funny that she doesn't even know the senior Quadrant's wing leader. <laughs> only She only knows her as the woman she sees talking to Zayden in battle brief. Okay, Violet, let's show your emotions some more. Really? Literally? <laughs> It's so funny. And the advice continues. Talk to your nearby squad mates while you're on the path, as it will help the dragons get a sense of who you are and how well you play with others. There is a correlation between Bonnie cadets and the level of chatter, which I think is so interesting what some of these people decide to talk about and why they think this is going to impress a dragon. But anyways, yeah, they can feel free to look at the dragons, especially when they are showing off their tails. But they should abstain from eye contact if they value their lives. <laughs> <laughs> and if they come across a scorch mark, they should just make sure that the fire is out and continue on like nothing fucking happened. She's like, enjoy your walkthrough like it's fucking Jurassic Park. <laughs> Literally. So we got a few dragons mentioned here at presentation. We have a trio of dread dragons with talons half of Violet size. We have a set of browns, both slightly smaller than her mother's dragon, Ainsir. Mm-hmm. There's another set of reds, a single brown and a pair of greens. And at the end of this line stood a small golden dragon. 
Sunlight reflects off of its scales and horns as it swings its feather tail. It has sharp teeth and quick darting movements of its head as it studies them. And at full height, it's only a few feet taller than Violet. It's like a little squishy, like a little, a little, little baby. Love dragon. Yeah. I love those memes too, where it's like, this is what you picture in your head. And it's like this big fluffy, cuddly yeah. dragon. And really, it's like this fucking monster dragon <laughs> in real life. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I just thought we should talk about the dragons they see before we get into the drama of what happens while course, they're taking yeah. their walk through. So basically... Yeah. As we know, Tynan is a pain in the butt when they are walking through pr- the presentation, complaining that he can't see the dragon's tails and he needs to figure out which dragon he is going to approach during threshing. Violet has to remind him that this walk is for the dragons to decide who they want to bond with, not the other way around. Rhiannon quietly whispers that she hopes one of them finds him unworthy so he doesn't make it to threshing. Just so funny. <laughs> <laughs> to distract Rihanna, who is like, whoa, these dragons are way bigger than I thought, Violet asks about her sister's pregnancy and if she's going to have a new niece or nephew. Rihanna didn't know, but she is hoping she is going to have a girl. She will find out when they can finally write to their family members again. Yes, yeah, so we're reminded here that first years cannot write to their families at all. They are only allowed to communicate with people in this quadrant specifically. Yes. Which Violet thinks that this rule is bullshit and she's going to be loyal to her wing no matter if she has a letter from her sister or not. Mm-hmm. Tynan is being a jerk again, of course, about Mira and wondering how Mira got all the good traits and Violet got nothing. <laughs> so annoying. So annoying. Also, Rhiannon wants to know why Violet didn't tell her about her rope plan or the dagger. And Violet says that she thought of it yesterday, and if it didn't work, she didn't want Rhiannon to be named an accomplice. That Rhiannon has a real future, but Rhiannon doesn't want Violet to protect her. So Violet promises her that if she needs help that Rhiannon is capable of giving, then she will ask Rhiannon if Rhiannon promises to do the same. Dane, take notes again. Yeah. Keep taking notes. This is real friendship here. Yes. The squad then begins to argue in front of the dragons about the golden dragon, which is just so annoying and so stupid. Yeah, like they can hear you. I don't understand. Like, you're so supposed dumb. to be impressing them. Yeah, and Sawyer's like, shut the fuck up. Literally. <laughs> if I was sorry, I'd be like, doop, doop taking a step back (laughs) for sure prior kind of sort of suggests that they head back and as they do violet makes a joke that they could all be in a worse predicament and walking past wyvern so wyvern they're folklore and they're kind of like dragons but bigger with two feet instead of four a mane of razor sharp feathers down their neck and a taste for humans unlike dragons who think humans are a little (laughs) gamey Rhi says her mother used to tell her and her sister that they would be plucked off the porch by them if they talked back, and their eerie-eyed venom riders would take them prisoner if they took treats that they weren't allowed to have. Ooh. Violet's dad also used to read these fables to her every night. She asked him once if her mother was a venom because she could channel, but Re asks if he told her they could supposedly only turn venom if you channel directly from the source. Hmm. Interesting Some information. Silly fables. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently her mom was so tired one night and she came home and her eyes were red. Probably blood yeah. talk from like flying for so long or battling something. And Violet sees her eyes. She's like, oh my God, my mom's a medin. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably from the fucking wind on the back of a dragon. No, for sure. And my eyes are watering thinking about it. <laughs> I know. But Violet's just too smart for her own good, of course. So mm-hmm. probably at like three, four years old, she was probably smarter than everyone in her household. Literally. As they continue their walk back, Pryor does then get scorched by being indecisive by a red dragon, which is so sad. I know. R.I.P. <laughs> Pryor. All of a sudden, two green dragons are standing in front of Violet. Yes, and she remembers that to approach a green dragon, lower your eyes in supplication and wait for their approval because greens are the most reasonable. Mm -hmm. Violet tells the green dragons that she cut her hands at the obstacle course and then they are smelling where her vest is and Violet lets them know that they can smell Tyne. She explains to them that Mira is her sister and she collected the scales after her dragon had shedded them and had them shrunk down to make a vest to keep Violet safe. She tells them that this vest has kept her safe a few times but no one knows that they are there besides Mira and Tyne. Basically the greens are like okay 
that's good enough for answer for me. I yeah. accept this answer. Obviously, we know that they're the most reasonable. And if you give them a logical explanation, then I feel like that satisfies their curiosity or any anger that they may have had. Yeah, I think at first they were probably thinking like, why the fuck do you have green scales? What did you do to my dragon kind? Yeah, like, how do you have this? Do you hurt someone? Do you do yeah. hurt someone I know? Yeah. Violet then tells Rihanna, who is like, on the verge of a mental breakdown after seeing Violet being sniffed by two green dragons yeah. that the vest that she's wearing has dragon scales in it. And that's why they were so curious. So she's mm-hmm. sharing her secrets with Rian and now after the conversation about sharing secrets. <laughs> Nice follow through, Violet. (laughs) Yes. Riddick was also very scared for Violet's life. But Luca makes a side comment about not blaming them if they tried to eat Violet, that Violet is the weakest link in their squad after Pryor. And then she is no longer talking because one of the dragons kills her. And now their squad's down to six first years. Damn. She deserved it. That one deserved it, Luca. Yeah, she was annoying. She was annoying. And now we'll never have to hear her again. (laughs) Nope. Chapter 13, October 1st. Threshing has arrived. Violet is not speaking to Dane. And Violet is trying to focus on the task at hand, bonding with a dragon. But even after reviewing all the dragons who are up for bonding this year, she does not feel a connection to any of them. Even while wandering in the valley, she doesn't feel pulled in any way, but she spots our trio of bad guys, Jack, Orin, and Tynan, talking about how they are going to kill the pretty baby golden dragon because they are monsters. Monsters. Violet cannot let this occur, and she makes her way to confront them and to protect Goldie. The boys do not care and feel like they will be getting two for the price of one since they also feel like Violet is too weak to be a part of the wing. Zayden is watching along with Sigale, who is pissed the F off that these boys would have the audacity to try to kill a dragon. We will have to see what happens next during this chapter. Wild. These fucking idiots. I know. Every single dragon is watching what goes on today, too. Yeah. Like. They're so stupid. They're so stupid. So the epigraph for this chapter is, there is nothing quite as humbling or as awe-inspiring as witnessing threshing for those who live through it anyway. From Colonel K.R.E.'s Field Guide to Dragonkind. I also would like to witness threshing. I don't think I would be a rider, but I would like to go watch it happen. Yeah. This must be so exhilarating to realize in the moment you could die. They could be killing you if you make one wrong move, but they actually like you and they're going to give you all their magic. Yeah. (laughs) Or the ability to channel. For sure. Crazy. We learn that threshing always occurs on October 1st, no matter what day of the week it is. And there are 147 cadets participating today after presentation. Yes. And if a dragon selects them, they will be calling. So they have to pay attention to their surroundings and their feelings and go with them or far away from them, depending on what those feelings are. Yeah. (laughs) If they move around in groups, they're more likely to be incinerated than bonding. The scribes have run the statistics and they are definitely better off alone. If they are not chosen by nighttime, then there is definitely a problem. Mm -hmm. They will be brought out by a professor or senior leadership, so they shouldn't give up and think that they've forgotten about them. Violet, of course, is nervous, as I'm sure the other cadets are as well, but she's Mm -hmm. thinking, what if she doesn't bond? Does she get thrown back in time and time again to restart the first year until something puts her on the death roll? Oh, sad. Freaking out. Freaking out. I'd be but freaking I out too. I understand why. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure they all are like shitting their pants. Oh, for sure. Because Sawyer cool. Sawyer is one of their best friends. And he didn't bond last year and had to do all this process over again and go through the gauntlet and presentation and all that. Like yeah. that is just so scary. Yeah. It's like you did all this for nothing. It must feel so defeating, but... Yeah. Oh, we'll see what happens. We'll so see what happens. Violet says Dane has tried to talk her into a brown, which is interesting. But Rhiannon says that he lost his vote when he tried to talk her into leaving, which, yes, girlfriend, that's exactly right. Though I am interested in why he thought a brown would be best for Violet when I feel like he would be like, if you're going to bond, maybe a green would be best because yeah. they're the most level headed and reasonable. The only thing I can think of is because the mom has a brown. Mm. So maybe for that reason, the browns would favor her or something. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But Mira has a green. 
right? Yeah, Mira has a green. Yeah, who yeah. knows? Even after presentation, Amanda, Dane is still trying to get her to leave. Even after presentation. She should have just fucking took a dagger to his throat at this point. <sighs> I know. I would have. Like, instead of Helga, just yeah. with a dagger. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Take him out. So Violet is doing what she's supposed to be doing. She's wandering through the forest, the woods, and she comes across every color of dragon during her walk, but she is not feeling connected to any of these dragons. Mm -hmm. And she's seen dragons launch into the air with their new riders over the past hour. So she's freaking out. Yeah. The anxiety is getting to her. Yeah. She climbs the nearest tree and she does feel some relief when she sees a dozen first years still wandering aimlessly. And then she spots the golden dragon. According to stupid Jack Barlow, the feathered tail is unrideable, a certified freak and useless in combat because they refuse to fight. Violet questions where the hell he's getting his information from since no one knows anything about feather tails. Hmm, that's hmm. definitely something to think about. Definitely something to think about. Mm -hmm. So Orin and Tynan are with Jack hunting the golden feather tail, though Orin knows that they are so screwed if they get caught. Violet doesn't know where Professor Kaori is or if there's any senior leadership around, and so she knows she has to go and get to the golden dragon first before this group does. On her run, though, through the forest to get to the dragon before these idiots, she stumbles and sprains her ankle because of course she did. Of course, she's always in pain. So Violet does make it before the boys and she tries to warn Goldie and tells her to get out of here, that the boys are going to kill her if she doesn't. But Goldie just looks at her and squishes its tail. <laughs> it's like, hey. Hey, you want to be friends? Yeah. <laughs> also, how fucking dumb and stupid are these guys? We already know they're idiots, but now they're slower than Violet with a sprained ankle. Yeah. Dumb. They suck. Goldie then sees Jack and he tells her that they are going to make this harmless while Violet is yelling at Goldie to scorch them. <laughs> Goldie backs up and growls but doesn't fly away. So Violet steps out into the clearing and tells the boys that they cannot do this. Jack is fucking ecstatic. He now Literally. thinks that he can get two weaklings at the same time. Violet tries to plead with Orin because she heard him say like we shouldn't be doing this like we're so screwed if we get caught so she feels like she can reason with him the best yeah but with jack's influence none of these boys are going to back down violet tells them that they are going to have to go through her if they plan on killing the golden dragon and jack says he doesn't see this as a problem He's and like, perfect perfect i can't wait i've been wanting to kill you since You're day one of my kill list anyway yeah <laughs> it's like golden dragon violet like they flip-flopped in that moment literally now they're there together yeah and then Zayden steps out into view and tells them that he strongly recommends that they think about their next actions. And her scalp prickles and she turns around and sees Zayden leaning against a tree and Segale is with him. Yes, and now we know for sure that anytime the scalp prickles is on the page, Zayden is around. Yes, <laughs> it happens a million times. A million times. Going into chapter 14, Jack doesn't give a flying F that Zayden is there since he cannot step in due to the rules. Zayden says he can't stop them, but Segale can. Mm -hmm. The boys are fucking idiots, so of course they completely ignore what Zayden says and charges at both Violet and Goldie. Violet held the line and kicked some serious ass that had Jack running away like a baby and Aura knocked out on the ground. With one bastard left, he almost bested Violet, but a massive black dragon appears behind Violet and burns him away. The black dragon who had not chosen to bond this year has now chosen our favorite gal because the courage and strength she had to defend Goldie. Violet struggle buses to climb on Taren, aka the black dragon, but manages because our girl always finds a way. But while flying back to the flight field, she falls off. Oops. Oops. One of many times. <laughs> so the epigraph for this chapter is, in the six centuries of recorded history of dragon and rider, there have been hundreds of known cases where a dragon simply cannot emotionally recover from the loss of their bonded rider. This happens when the bond is particularly strong and in three documented cases has even caused the untimely death of a dragon. And this is from Navarre, an unedited history by Colonel Lewis Markham. 
Interesting epigraph indeed. So with Zayden there, Violet feels like he won't let this happen and she has hope even though she knows that Zayden hates her. But she knows with the rules he cannot interfere. So for a second she has hope then she's like, wait, he literally can't do anything. Yeah. Violet is not happy that she's going to have an audience for her death. Jack tells Zayden that they don't want to rethink their actions and there is nothing he can do about it. And Zayden informs that, that they shouldn't be worried about him. They should be worried about Sigil, who is Duh. literally growling at them. The fire breathing, razor sharp teeth, giant ass dragon that could literally smack you with its tail and knock you the fuck out and kill you. Yeah. I'm surprised Sigil doesn't step in. I'm surprised too, but also I see it making sense story-wise why she didn't. Well, of course, they had to do it for the plot, but yeah. I still think that she could have at least blown some flame at them. I don't know. Yeah, or scared them or done something. Yeah. It would have been funny if they like she burned their eyebrows off or something. <laughs> <laughs> Violet turns her attention to Tynan and asks if he is really going to attack a squad mate, but Tynan tells her that squads don't need anything today. So Violet takes another look at Goldie and says, that's a no one flying, but Goldie <laughs> is not moving and she doesn't even have claws to help her out. She literally has paws. Yeah, not okay. even like cat paws where the nails come out. Yeah, they're just like just these paws. like just cute little paws like meow. Oh, he's so cute. I love Goldie. I love Goldie. Violet throws her dagger first as they start charging towards them, and her dagger hits her mark. It hits Jack in the shoulder of his sword arm, and Jack's sword falls to the ground and he cries out in pain. Wah, what a baby. Call the Wandalance. <laughs> Violet's second dagger landed in Tynan's thigh, which slowed him down but did not stop him. Oren gets to her first and slices across her ribs as he goes for Violet's neck, but he hits her stomach with his sword and it slides right off her armor. Thanks, Mira. Thanks, Mira. Again. Ja <laughs> Again. Jack is crying that Violet destroyed his shoulder and he orders the other two to kill her before he turns and runs away. Dude, I don't understand his actions and his thoughts. How about like Tynan and Orin who just blindly listen to him because they do continue to fight Violet and she gets a good few stabs in Tynan. Orin comes at her from behind and Zayden shouts behind you and she's able to get out of the way and then knocks Orin out. So these boys who their leader just left them to go bond with the dragon leave them to do his dirty work and they're just like yeah it. we're gonna do it. What? No shit. They're not like where the fuck are you going? Yeah. They don't question it at all. Interesante. Tynan is mad, saying Zayden can't interfere. But Zayden says he can't, but he can narrate. <laughs> Which, I love that line, too. Yeah. Violet is very confused to see Zayden on her side. But she doesn't think it has anything to do with her. He thinks it's just about him protecting the golden dragon. Tynan knows that Violet's arm is shot, because he gets a good stab in there. And just before he makes his killing blow on Violet, Zayden takes a step forward. He steps forward. He's going to intervene if he has to. But then Tynan is backing up and his mouth is hanging wide open. Violet turns to see why and she is also shook. Standing with Goldie is the unbonded black dragon. Woo! Woo! It was the biggest dragon Violet has ever seen. She doesn't even come close to reaching its ankle. Like, let's think about that for a second. Its ankle? Yeah. How tall is its ankle? I don't know. That foot must be huge. Huge. <laughs> it also was standing over the little golden dragon, and it talks to Violet and called her the silver one. Do we have a bonding happening here? Do we? Oh. The black dragon wants Violet to move out of the way so that he can incinerate Tynan. He also wants Violet to kill Orin. Violet says she cannot kill an unconscious man, but the dragon says that Orin would have killed her if the roles were reversed. Mm -hmm. She's like, that's on his character, not on mine. But Tynan is now incinerated and we don't care because he's a jerk face. Yeah, you deserved it. The dragon is also annoyed that Violet is bleeding and tells her to stop it. <laughs> 
It's like, great idea. I'll do that right now. Just the beginning of this fucking Black Dragon, oh, man. He's hilarious. Also, he we learned that the Golden Dragon can fly as it flies away once the Black Dragon is telling Violet to get on his back. I can see Violet's face in this moment. She's probably like, what? She's like, are you freaking kidding you. me? Like, I told you to fly <laughs> away and now you fly once it's over? Yeah, literally. So we learned that this Black Dragon has lived over a century. He tells Violet to get on him. He has chosen oh. her. Oh, shit. Oh, my okay. God. And he even bows to make it easier for her to climb on. And dragons do not supplicate for no. anyone. He tells her his full name, Ternanach, son of Mercudium and Fiaclanful. Probably botching these. I'm sorry. <laughs> Descended from the cunning, the modern line. I feel like you have to say it in an accent. Yeah. But he will go by Tern. We learn that the pommel is where the dragon's neck meets his shoulders also. So a little bit about dragons in general and about our black over a century year old guy yeah. here. <laughs> Middle aged <laughs> dragon crump, crump. here. Violet is loving life in the air on Taren until she slips off his back and falls. <laughs> yeah. She's like, this is amazing. <laughs> ah, <fuck>. <laughs> <laughs> Two seconds after being in her seat. Literally. Which brings us to chapter 15. Thank Taryn that he catches Violet on her way to plummeting to her death. And he throws her back onto his back and asks her not so nicely to stop embarrassing him. They complete some tricks in the air. And while he holds Violet in her seat and they finally land in the field with all the newly bonded riders. Also, Goldie is following them and lands next to Taryn. When Violet tells the role keeper her dragon's name, not only has she shocked them with Taryn choosing her, but Goldie, aka Indarna, has also bonded to Violet. Two dragons? Oh my. Two dragons, baby. Has not ever happened before, but here we go. Here we go. But I guess no one's ever really tried to kill a feather tail before either. So this is just a whole unique threshing. <laughs> Literally unprecedented. Yeah. So the epigraph for this chapter is, just because you survive threshing doesn't mean you'll survive the ride to the flight field. <laughs> Being chosen isn't the only test. And if you can't hold your seat, then you'll fly straight into the ground. Page 50 of the Book of Brennan. <laughs> Yes, and I don't really go into this much, but when Violet is back up in the air, she does see some riders falling from their dragons, and those dragons do not yeah. catch them like Taryn catches her. Yeah, it's not common for a dragon to bow to help their rider get on them, hold them in their seat, which we're going to talk about in this chapter, and mm -hmm. literally catch them out of midair. Like, you know, if you fall, you die. But yep. not with Taryn. Nope. So, like I said, Taryn catches Violet and before throwing her back onto his back, tells her to stop making them look bad. Yes. According to Professor Kaori, Taryn is one of the deadliest dragons in Navarre. He hadn't agreed to a bond this year, and he hadn't even been seen in the last five years. His hmm. last rider, we learned, died in the Tyrish Rebellion. The mental bond between riders and dragons is way more intense than Violet expected. Yeah, for sure. Just like him being her head and talking to her... It's just like an overwhelming experience. Yeah, and she, I think, realizes too in this chapter that she's never going to have a thought again that Taryn doesn't know about. Literally. <laughs> so Taryn tells Violet to stay in her seat or no one is going to believe that he chose her. Violet can't believe that he chose her. <laughs> she's like, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Taryn says that she will need to practice and strengthen her legs. And she says, okay, yeah, but nothing would have prepared me for Taryn and his massive size. Even though she does not feel strong, Taryn says he knows exactly who Violet is. Violet never thought that she would make it this far. And Taryn said he didn't think he would either so that they have that in common, which me and Amanda had differing opinions when we were reading this about what this meant. But yeah. I just think it's a very interesting line. Yeah. I agree. Taryn says that they need to put on a show, so he straps her in magically, and they do some flips and dives and tricks, and Taryn says that he picked Violet because she saved Goldie, and that Violet should not tell him what he should value in a rider. That's right, Taryn. Tell her. Tell her. So a little bit more about dragons on threshing. Most riders choose to wear goggles because the dragons whip through the air, putting their riders through a trial of dips and turns. The dragons are divided into two lines facing each other. 
One line is those who chose writers in years past, and one line is those who chose today. Violet and Taryn are the 71st Bond to enter the fields. So I guess that makes her and Andarna 72. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Before Violet dismounts from Taryn, he tells her that she is the smartest in her year and she defended Goldie with ferocity and strength of courage, and that is more important than physical strength. I agree. Violet then realizes that Taryn can hear her thoughts and he tells her she will never be alone again. Violet tells Taryn she knows what to do with the role keeper when he's trying to boss her around and Violet thinks the other dragons are muttering and Taryn says that they are and to ignore them. (laughs) Violet cannot believe she is now officially a rider. Yay, go Violet! Now that Violet is on the ground, she turns to Goldie and says that she's very glad to see her alive but maybe she should fly off the next time she's in danger and Goldie says maybe I was saving you except she says it more like maybe I was saving you yes I love <laughs> the graphic audio for his name the voice of Mandarna is so cute I know I love it Violet tells her not to speak to humans who they are not bonded to and she doesn't want her getting in trouble but Goldie just sits yeah, she's like, hee 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 Violet makes her way over to the role keeper and Commandant Panchak is like, is that? But Violet, her stupid mom, says, let her say the name first. Her stupid mom. <laughs> she is stupid. Violet gives Taryn's full name and the role keeper is like, wow, he's a legend. And then Goldie gives her name as well for Violet to give. And Violet is shocked. She turns back to look at them both and Taryn tells Violet to say the name to the role keeper and then she does yes and just another name I'm about to botch but I think it's Indarnaram Indarna for short she tells Violet her full name which means exactly what you think it means Violet bonds two fucking dragons let's go Chaos ensues. Yes. <laughs> and the place erupts. <laughs> yeah. That's how that chapter ends. <laughs> Our second to last chapter, chapter 16, everyone is in an uproar that Violet has two dragons, but it's not up to the humans to decide what is right. It is up to the Empyrean. Silly humans, you only act like you have the power, but they mean nothing. Violet gets stitched up, has a verbal showdown with Jack. Taryn advises Violet to stay with Zayden, confusing Violet. Dane has another mental breakdown for the millionth time in this book and wants Violet to choose Goldie since she wouldn't be able to bear a rider. And Zayden shuts Dane up. It was beautiful. Violet and Zayden's lives and are tied together through their mated dragons. <laughs> the dragons have a meeting and come back and decide that the decision will stand and Violet will be able to keep her two dragons. Yay! (laughs) Also, Violet's besties, Rian and Riddick and Sawyer, all survive threshing. They get really cool relics branded onto them by their dragons, and then Dane has the audacity to kiss Violet. But she feels nothing for him. Hmm, I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder fucking why. (laughs) Multiple reasons at this point. But also, a kiss right here? Make it make sense, Dane. Yeah, well, we, we'll get into it. Are you happy that she fucking, I don't understand. But yeah, you're right, we'll get into it. You will get into it. So the epigraph for this chapter is, Though this officer considers himself to be an expert on all matters dragon kind, there is a great deal we don't know about the way dragons govern themselves. There is a clear hierarchy among the most powerful, and deference is paid to elders. But I have not been able to discern how it is they make laws for themselves, or at what point a dragon decided to bond only one rider rather than go for better odds with two. This is from Colonel Kaori's Field Guide to Dragon Kind. Interesting thought. For sure. But literally all of senior leadership is yelling at each other at the beginning of the chapter while Violet is getting stitched up by Professor Kaori. Violet is just in shock that she has bonded not one dragon, but two dragons, since at the beginning of this, she didn't think she was going to bond at all. Now, let's go into the bonded pairs before we continue this chapter. Yes, so Jack Barlow bonds with an orange scorpion tail, whose name is Bade, and he had four other riders before Jack. As aggressive as Bade might be, though, he is no match for Taryn. 
No one has ever bonded two dragons before, and Darna, though, cannot bear a rider. She's just too small. Rhiannon bonds the green dagger tail, Furge. Riddick bonds a brown sword tail, Aeotrum. Sawyer bonds a red sword tail that I think his name is Silsi. Trina didn't make it. She fell off the back of an orange club tail. Tynan didn't make it either because, of course, Taryn killed him for fucking with Indarna. So that's where we are with our bonds so far that we know about. That makes me so sad that Trina fell off the back of her dragon. I know. Like, she bonded. And she was so quiet. But it's so interesting that she bonded an orange with being how quiet she is. Interesting, yeah. I feel like everybody else's dragon makes sense, but, like, Trina getting an orange is weird. Yeah, unpredictable, most risky, and the quiet girl gets it. Maybe they just thought she was, like, quiet but sneaky or something. Ooh, maybe. Interesting. Yeah. So, Professor Carey has to step in between Violet and Jack when Jack comes after Violet again. But Violet reminds him that he ran the last time they showed down and she didn't. That's the right. The professor says that Jack should not be worried about him, but Taryn, who is looking like he's about to eat Jack, when Jack's like, oh, professors are stepping in for you now? Like, no. Taryn's gonna eat you. Yeah. <laughs> and Jack cannot believe Violet has bonded the Black Dragon. I can believe it. Jack, this motherfucker thought the Black Dragon was gonna choose him. Come on. Come on. Learn something about dragons. <laughs> He's an idiot. He is an idiot. So we do learn a little bit about the Empyrean here because yeah. Karen tells Violet that the Empyrean will decide what happens with her bonding two dragons. Yeah. So the Empyrean is essentially the dragon government. It's run by the elders, but it seems like everyone really gets a say. Humans can't know what is said within the Empyrean. That's no. the rule. Mm-hmm. So every rider was blocked from the conversation between them. Not just Violet, because obviously we're in Violet's POV, so she notices, I can't get in touch with my dragons, what the fuck's going on? But she is not the only one in the dark. Yeah, and Coda, General Mel Green's dragon, is the one that comes and collects the dragon, and Taryn tells Violet to stay with the wing leader while the dragons fly off and have their discussion. But Violet is pulled away by Dane, who is in disbelief that Violet has bonded two dragons. <sighs> stay with the wing leader. Fuck Dane. <laughs> Dane wants Violet to choose Indarna because he does not believe that Violet will be able to keep both. If she chooses Indarna, she will never have to be in battle since Indarna will not be able to hold a rider. Violet would most likely work at the school as a professor. And Dane says that if she chooses Tern, that she will get herself killed with Zayden. She would be tied to him because... Yep, you guessed it. Tern, Violet's new dragon, and Segale, Zayden's dragon, are a mated pair of course they are of course they are they are the strongest bonded pair in centuries and according to zayden Sagal saw how violet defended andarna and told her mate but this links them all together violet to her dragon her dragon to her and Sagal, and then Sagal to zayden ultimately connecting the four of them a big dragon bonded family <laughs> Yeah, not a happy bonded family at the moment, but a bonded family. Yeah. Dane believes Zayden did this on purpose, but Zayden appears and asks Dane if he wants to make that a formal accusation. Dane wants to know if Zayden stepped in, and Zayden said he basically saw Violet outnumbered, being reckless, but so brave. But yes, just as Amanda said, Sigail saw everything too. Violet said she would do this all over again, and Zayden says he is well the fuck aware. <laughs> Sigail does not like bullies, and she's fond of Indarna, so she called for Taryn. Taryn chose Violet all on his own. There was nothing Dane or Zayden could do about it. Zayden then forces Dane to answer if he would have stepped in to help Violet, even though it's against the rules. And Dane says, no, he wouldn't have. Of course not. You only want to break the rules and get her out of the fucking quadrant, but you don't want to save her. Idiot. Violet is now shocked that her life is now tethered to Zayden's and Zayden is worried about the unbonded who may want to take her out and then they would be taking him out. Yeah. So there are at least three dozen unbonded riders watching them and ready to kill and steal their dragons in any moment. Taryn just happens to be one of the strongest dragons on the continent and the vast power he channels is about to be Violet's making her public enemy number one. Of course it does, because the girl needs more targets on her back. Yeah, she didn't have enough before. No, definitely not. She's like one of those girls that has just like those red 
laser things like pointing at her as she walks everywhere. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> so the dragons come back and Taryn tells Violet that all is how it should be. Violet will be able to keep both Taryn and Indarna. And General Mel Green announces this to everyone that since there has been no precedent for the situation, the decision stands. Yep. And part of the ceremony is that the dragons are giving their riders this unique relic by blasting their riders with fire, I assume, or some kind of magical blast. Blast? <laughs> yeah. At least it felt like fire to Violet. Violet's relic was a dragon mid-flight stretching from shoulder to shoulder and in the center was a silhouette of a little golden one that officially marks her as their rider i love it i love it too it's actually on the back of my sweatshirt Ah! so cool What I don't love is Dane then approaches Violet and kisses her at the end of this chapter. At first, she is so excited because this is everything she's been waiting for, but she feels no chemistry with him and knows that she is not meant to be with Dane. No L- foot rising in this kiss. No, there's <laughs> like no princess foot diaries. Pop. Yeah. yeah. My foot didn't pop. Yeah, no foot pop. But also, Dane's motivation for kissing her here is not genuine. No. It's not genuine. He probably just feels bad about him saying he wouldn't have stepped in to help his best friend. Yeah. And now he's trying to show her in some ass backwards way that he does care for her. But it's just... Or... I don't know. He's literally a walking contradiction. If he kisses her in this moment, I was shocked. Yeah, like cringe. Not like shock, like, oh, no, it's like, oh, what are you yeah. doing? What is happening? Yeah. And Violet probably yeah. was like, oh, yeah. Not good. Not good. <laughs> well, I couldn't end this section on that chapter because disgusting. No. So we so are ending <laughs> this episode with chapter 17. And chapter 17, Violet finally gets a private room and apparently was the only one who didn't use the privacy to get laid after threshing. There are new power dynamics in the quadrant after threshing and now Violet is beloved because she's bonded to basically the strongest dragon there is. She is also still public enemy number one. Mm-hmm. Imogen will now be helping her with training from an order from Zayden and we we get to see Violet's first flight lesson with Taryn, where she continues to fall off every five seconds. You go, girl. <laughs> you go, girl. The epigraph for our last chapter in this section is, it is therefore only natural that the more powerful the dragon, the more powerful the signet its rider manifests. One should beware of a strong rider who bonds a smaller dragon, but even wearier of the unbonded cadet who will stop at nothing to seize a chance to bond. This is from... Major Offenda's Guide to the Rider's Quadrant, the unauthorized edition. Yep. Perks of being a fucking bonded rider, they get their own room. Woo! <laughs> no more military sleeping arrangements. <laughs> no. Rhiannon and Sawyer have a steamy night together. Go Sawyer. And... Go Rhiannon. Go Sawyer. Go Sawyer. Go Rhiannon. <laughs> And we know that Liam also had a night of fun, which, whew, that man is fine. So I also would love to have a night with Liam as me well. Me too. Yes. <laughs> Count me in. Yeah. Everyone had a fun night, it seems, except for Violet. But we do know that others, including Rhiannon, saw Violet and Dane kissing on the flight field. And Violet informs Rhiannon that they did not have any chemistry. Wah, wah, wah. Violet also tells Rhiannon that she no longer has breakfast duty because the less desirable duties are now being given to the unbonded. Ooh. Which just <laughs> gives the un- the yeah, which just gives the un- unbonded another reason to hate everyone. And to I think that's Violet. the point. Yeah, that's the point, I think. No, I know, yeah. Like, they have to be reminded over and over again that they are literally at the bottom of the barrel now and they need to do everything it takes to get up in yeah. the ranks. No, for sure. So we do learn a little bit more about everyone else's relics. We learn that Riddick has a brown dragon silhouette on his upper arm and Reese is some you will never see but apparently Sawyer saw it Woohoo! <laughs> Oren who did not bond after his antics now has breakfast duty and so Violet does not want to take food from him since he is glaring at her so yeah, she grabs some like, fruit instead she's like nah I know what happens in that kitchen 
<laughs> yeah, better not. I'm not surprised he didn't bond. Yeah. You think a dragon is going to want to bond you if you try and kill a dragon? Yeah, technically Jack did charge, but he never got close enough to attempt anything because yeah. he ran away after Violet injured him first. So technically he didn't do anything except lead the gang there where the other two actively fought Violet. Right, yeah. Like Megan said in her summary, the power balance does shift and Violet is going to be the strongest in the quadrant once her signet manifests. Mm-hmm. Stupid Jack Barlow's dragon is on the smaller side, putting him at the bottom of the totem pole for now. Love it. Stay there, motherfucker. Stay there. <laughs> Imogen and the rest of their squad are now sitting with them, and we get to learn more about the squad as well. We all know Imogen, but Quinn and Heaton and Emery, who are third years in their squad, have now sat down with them. Yes, and we got some more information about these patches here. We learned that they actually change every year, which makes sense to me. You got to switch it up so that everybody stays on their toes. You only know the information if you know it at that point. Yep, yeah, exactly. The first patch they are given represents their squad. Violets is a flame with the emblem of fourth wing and a reddish two in the center. Violet's favorite patch, though, is the iron squad patch. They earned it by having the most surviving members since parapet. Mm-hmm. Flight leathers, though, do not include any insignia. No names, no patches, nothing that could give them away if they separated from their dragons. Just a lot of sheaths to hold weapons. Yeah, because now they have flight leathers because they're riders! Yes! We are starting to learn more about signet powers here, too. And we start with Emery, and she has air manipulation signet powers. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. We learn, too, that the bond between rider and dragon strengthens when they talk through their mind connection. So the more they interact with each other, the stronger their bond's going to get. For sure. Imogen gives food to Violet as Violet needs to eat more than just fruit. And (laughs) Taryn tells Violet that she can trust Imogen. Imogen also informs Violet that they will be training together, that she can continue to work with Rhiannon, but she will also be working with Imogen on weights. When Violet looks over at Zayden, Garrick is the one who looks at her first, and he looks worried. They know about her fate being tied to his. Violet thinks Zayden looks freaking beautiful, peeling an apple, (laughs) and when their gazes lock, her whole head tingles. When Zayden looks at Imogen, though, she knows for sure that he has ordered her to train Violet. Zayden now has to keep his mortal enemy alive. Yes, and she has to keep it in her pants. <laughs> <laughs> she literally is getting off of him peeling an apple at this point. Like, talk about sexual frustration. Right? She needs help. Yes, she needs help. So here we are at our first flight lesson. And Darna is enjoying since she can't technically bear a rider. Professor Kaori is using lesser magic to project his voice to the 92 riders that have bonded dragons, even though there were 101 willing to bond. But willing, as we know, doesn't mean that they found worthy riders. Mm-hmm. So there are 41 unbind who would kill to be where these riders are right now who actually yeah. did bond. Their first lesson is to mount their dragons and follow a series of maneuvers that the dragons already know. Their only goal today is to stay in their seat. And Violet, of course, is having trouble staying seated. So Taryn uses a minuscule amount of power to hold her down. Yes, but Violet wants to practice sitting in the seat by herself without Taryn's magic. But the second he lets go, she falls and she keeps falling over and over again. Taryn growls at her and says it's the equivalent of a human's for fuck's sake. (laughs) He's like, oh, so embarrassing. (laughs) But she knows it's important. He is going to need all of his magic if they go into battle and he can't be holding her in her seat. Yeah, even though they say it's a minuscule amount of his power. So I'm sure, and if he's like the strongest motherfucker in this continent, I'm sure it's probably nothing, but you know, he has to have his whole power, sure. Yeah. (laughs) We also got another mention of Dune, the god here, the god of strength and war, but dragons pay no heed to humans puny gods yeah Taryn's like I don't give a shit about that shit yeah 
He's like, you can talk all you want to your God, but he ain't my God. <laughs> yeah. And to end this chapter, Violet is heading off to work out with Imogen and Dane stops her. He tells her that they cannot be together while he is her leadership as he wants to be a wing leader next year. Violet doesn't feel chemistry with him, so she was hoping that they were going to be on the same wavelength about that. But Dane is still Dane worrying about her and Taryn wants Dane to mind his own business. Yeah, torn tell. Him. Yeah, Violet's like, Phew, you don't want to be with me. Thank God. Thank God. Imogen scoops her away from Dane and says that she's helping Violet because of squad, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Imogen also doesn't want to hear it when Violet says the only reason she is helping her is because of Zayden. She's basically like, drop and give me 50. Let's go. Yeah. She's like, who cares who's making me do this? You're going to do it anyway. Yeah, exactly. We'll get more of the banter between Imogen and Violet next section, but that is all we have for you today. Please let us know what you think by leaving us a review and comments on any of the platforms you are listening slash watching on or on our social media pages. This helps tremendously to get the word out and lead more listeners to find our show and tune in. Yes, don't forget to email, follow, subscribe, rate us five stars, and tell all your friends about us, and we hope the rest of your day is blissful. Bye! Thank you so much for listening. Join us next week where we start part three of Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros, covering chapters 18 through 23. Happy reading! Happy reading!